So yeah. I just wanted to Let's let you all know that we have two more lessons today and next Sunday, and we're going to wind up this um, identity of priests and kings. And then my sister's going to fill in when I'm gone. I am. Yeah, I've asked you a lot of time ago. <laughs> No. Where are you going? Okay, never mind. I'll ask oh, someone else. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I didn't we're, know at okay. all. Okay, yeah. We're, we're, going to, no. we're going to Kauai for our annual oh, vacation. Oh, yeah. yeah. I so I can ask somebody that. else. That's okay. I thought I could have, <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's all right. Well, after I'm done to this Sunday and next Sunday, I will have somebody filling in for me on the following Sunday, and then we're going to start a new series yeah. when I get back. We're only missing one Sunday, so. All right. Um, for Wednesday nights, we're going to have, well, gonna, <coughs> let's see, Gail is going to do it, and I think we're just, let's see, Gail, we missed it on one the 31st. Wednesday. Right. So Gail will do Wednesday night class. Elise will be doing Healing Sunday service. Oh, wow. And Pastor Trevor will be doing the one morning service, or the two morning services, but we're only gone once. Oh, yeah. 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 All right. So. This morning, I just wanted to say um, we're going to get ready to pray, but thank you, Jesus, for this oh, sunshine. Yeah, I feel oh, like yeah. those of us in Seattle that have endured from <laughs> September through end of May here, <laughs> I, I love the sun. So thank you, Jesus, for that. Amen. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you this day for the people you have brought here, Lord, both in the service and in Bible study. We thank you for a hunger for more of you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that hunger is a sign of life and that, uh, Father, that you love us and you want us, Lord, to thrive and do well, Lord. And, um, Father, I thank you that in order for us to thrive and do well, we need to have hunger for more of you, more of yes, your Lord. presence and more of your word. Yes. And we just ask you to bless this word as we break the bread of the word together. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Yeah. amen. Yeah. All right. So yeah, as a 51-year-old person with a with a pretty busy job and all this stuff, it may be that I forgot to ask someone, so I will ask somebody. Don't worry about it. But uh, it was just that I've got so many schedules going on now that I can't even keep it all straight. You know, I have to try to take care of a bunch of schedules, so um, we won't worry about it. So today we are talking about kings and priests unto our God. And do you remember, I know it's been sort of discontinuous because we had Easter and we had Mother's Day and it kind of broke everything up a lot. But we were talking about garments or clothing or accessories. And I was teasing um, Gail that she would appreciate that because the priests, we learn um, from the Old Testament, from Jewish tradition, that the clothing um, symbolized the daily life of a priest. And so it's important what we wear, spiritually speaking, too, because that's what identifies us as kings and priests unto God. And so just like you would identify a police officer, besides the blue flashing lights in his patrol car, by his uniform, or a soldier by his uniform, Lord Jesus has given you and I the armor of God, and he's given us garments of praise, and he's given us a robe of righteousness that we would have, the garments that identify us as children of God, and more specifically as kings and priests, we have special garments. So we want to talk about that a little bit. So let's go ahead and turn our Bibles right now to Exodus 28. That's Exodus chapter 28. And who would like to read verses 1 through 4 this morning? Exodus 28 verses 1 through 4. Oh, great, Stephanie. Okay, Exodus 28, verses 1 through 4. Okay. Now take Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me as priest. Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. So you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister to me as priest. And these are the garments which they, sh which they shall make, a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a skillfully woven tunic, a turban, and a sash. So they shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother and his sons, that he may minister to me as priest. Thank you so much, Stephanie. So you notice here that God is saying, bring near Aaron, 
and also with him those that are going to minister in the priest's office, which is um, Aaron and his sons, basically. And what the Lord is having Moses do is we're going to set them apart. Now, you know, you and I were called out from darkness. And we've heard it said, uh, Tom talked about last Wednesday, to come out from the unclean thing and be ye separate. Yeah. Talking about yeah. holiness. Well, you know, the Jews referred to the priestly garments as garments of beauty and holiness. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very interesting because they're the garments of beauty or glory. Some translations say glory. Or the garments of beauty and holiness. And you know, it talks about worshiping the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Mm -hmm. Well, do you know there was a story, and I'm just going to take a pause right now, and I'm going to take you to the New Testament from what Stephanie just read. I want you to think about that we've been called out, we've been separated unto our God, and we've been given a new garment, right? right. Because the Bible says our garments, all of our righteousnesses, were as filthy rags fit to be burned. But the priests in the, New, in the Old Testament, when they wore special garments, it was to minister. It set them apart. That they could not come, and this is what it says in tradition, they could not come near God except that they had on their priestly garment. In other words, if they tried to show up as a priest without the priestly garment on, they could be punished. And they would come under the judgment of God at the very least. But that judgment could take on the form of stoning and literal death. So they could not approach holy God without first wearing the right garment. So I want you to keep that in mind because Stephanie just read for us that the garments of beauty and holiness, that there's a special garment that the priests that are called are supposed to wear. Now, think about this. In Hebrews, it says that Jesus Christ himself, his flesh was the veil, the veil to the temple. <laughs> that that veil is what we could look at. We could look at the personage, if you will, of Jesus Christ and not be consumed by the glory of God. Because why? Because that flesh kept us. Like Moses, he could only see the backside of God and show God would show him his glory. And he wasn't like totally annihilated, but he was transformed, wasn't he? Well, it says that we see Jesus and that that flesh acted as a veil, between the barrier, the safety, if you will, between sinful man and a holy God. And that we were able to approach God through the veil, Jesus Christ. And his flesh acted as that veil. So I want you to think about all this, about approaching God. You have to be clothed in the right garments. Jesus was the first one that allowed us to have free access. But think about this. Remember in Matthew 22, Jesus tells a story. It's a parable. And he talks about a wedding feast. And, that, and this is a very strange thing. And he talks about all these guests are invited, but there's one person that shows up without the right outfit. Anybody remember that one? Yeah. And yeah. if we didn't know some of these things, we could read this and think, that's really weird, Jesus. Why are you discriminating about the outfit? But it's because in those times, the groom of the wedding or the host of the wedding, if it was the father, yeah. would supply the garments. Like It's like saying the tuxedos for your best man and the groomsman. They would supply the garment, and you would wear that garment, and to not do that was to be rebellious. Right? All right, so then this man who refused to wear the right garment but tried to sneak into the feast, mm. this is so exciting, yeah. he was thrown out into weeping and, out, you know, and gnashing of teeth. And what we have found out is we have to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only He's one the way into God's wedding feast. You have to identify with Christ. And we know in the New Testament it talks about putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it also says that he has made our righteousness. And that he is our access way, our door, the veil that kept us from being annihilated by going into the Holy of Holies, the very presence of God. It says now we can come boldly to the throne of grace. So, but we have to have the right garment on. So what would you suppose the right, right wedding suit is as a priest? What kind of suit should we be wearing? What sort of garments do you think we should be wearing? Anybody? Go ahead. Anybody have an idea? Righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's right. That's the number one thing, Chris. People can say a lot of things, but it's really the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So we want to talk today about what it means to wear robes of righteousness. So turn with me now to Isaiah 61, verse 10. And we're going to take a little comparison here. Isaiah 61, 10. And while people are looking that up, 
I would like somebody else. Let's see. Gail, could you look up for us Hebrews 10, 19 through 22? So the first verse we're looking up is Isaiah 61, 10. And then Gail, could you look up for us Hebrews 10, 19 through 22? I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, with her jewels. Amen. Do you see that? I love that. Now this is Old Testament. Do you remember when Adam and Eve's sin when they fell in the garden, that all of a sudden it says their eyes were opened. And here's the irony of it. Their eyes were opened, but they were now ashamed. Mm -hmm. They saw their nakedness, they saw each other's nakedness, and had shame. And God provided the innocent blood of animals that were slain to clothe them with skins of animals, it says. He covered them. And now here in Isaiah, he says, through the prophet, my soul will rejoice and exult in God because he has clothed me. So where do we get our garment of righteousness from? Is it what we do? Is it something we make? Is it something we have to put together? No, he clothes me. And it's not with just any kind of robe. It's a robe of God's righteousness. So it's not my works. It's not my background. And it says, as a bridegroom decks himself, now my translation says, like a priest with a beautiful headdress. And as a bride adorns herself with jewels, so God clothes us. He clothes us not just in plain clothes, but like a bride or a bridegroom. He's making us ready for himself. Yes, Christopher. Well, I don't know if you just said this indirectly or if you already know, but what you just said just kind of turned on a light bulb. Uh, when you said that it was from an animal that died that, we were, that Adam and Eve were clothed, well, it was an animal's death that was a covering for us, so wearing animal skins is a picture of that covering. Yes, that's right. No, that's absolutely right. And um, we know that ultimately Jesus, as the Lamb of God, was slain as the ultimate covering. And what I like to bring out in Isaiah 61, though, is that the prophet is saying he's exceedingly happy. He's going to rejoice. Why? Because God's clothed him with righteousness. And so we have joy knowing that we don't have to rely on our own righteousnesses, which are as filthy rags, but that Father God gives us a beautiful robe of righteousness. Bob? Uh, I, I'm just a little bit confused with something here. And uh, it says, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. Mm -hmm. um, which salvation is he talking about? Because salvation hadn't come yet Yeah. Well, he's when he was speaking about himself. Yes. Well, okay. So... This would take too long to go into, so I'm not going to, but I will say this, is David talked about salvation too, and they were in the Old Testament. So Joe. And, so, and so did Abraham. Mm -hmm. So it's that they didn't have the full revelation we do, Bob, but they knew because they had some sort of relationship with God that they had salvation. They didn't have the kind that you and I know of today where you say the sinner's prayer and you have this relationship with Christ, but that equates to their relationship with God. So that's it. So they had salvation back then? As we have salvation no, today. No, not as today. No, not as today. Okay. They had, just like they had the anointing come upon them, but not abiding within them. Right? right? The anointing came upon David at times. It didn't abide within. Today it says you have no need for a teacher because you have the Holy One inside. Mm -hmm. Before they had a coming upon experience, now they have a coming in. Mm -hmm. The salvation that they had, that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Elijah, Elisha, anybody you want to name in the Old Testament, they had a relationship, but it wasn't perfect. It was pointing them to the future. They knew they had a relationship. They knew that that covenant was somehow going to save Israel and them, mm -hmm. but they didn't know it like we do. Mm -hmm. So they could point to it prophetically. Dicky. So basically they had a different understanding of being saved. Yes. Their salvation was a, a different understanding and knowledge, uh, uh, or a different knowledge of being saved. 
Well, absolutely, because you've got to think about it that a lot of them, now the prophets too, but a lot of them did not have the Bible as we do today. Right. Right. So, And it says in Hebrews that even the angels and the prophets of old were looking into the things. They wished they had the understanding right. we have now, but it was a mystery to them. But Hebrews 11 does a good job of telling us, but by faith, they still followed it. Like by faith, Abraham knew right. that he could lay hold of the promise, yeah. claiming those things that are not as though sure. they were, speaking those things that were not as though they were. But did they have a full understanding like we have the benefit of? No. Did they have the eternal indwelling presence? No. They had an experience that would be a coming was upon. Um, I, I won't even say that because I don't want yeah, to go there. Yeah, yeah. But um, anyway, so the point is that God is saying that he's clothed us with the garments of salvation. He provides the clothing. He provides the equipment. He provides the outfit. And um, now we have this other verse to go with it. Gail, go ahead with Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. Okay. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Right. So I'm going to tell you something interesting about all of this, is that Jesus made us a new and living way. We have been brought near. It says that because of what? Because of his blood and because of his broken body that was that flesh. We now know that the temple curtain that used to separate all the regular people from God's holy presence, Jesus as our high priest by his broken body has opened the curtain, so to speak. When that temple yeah. curtain was rent in two, that was a sign that we could now come boldly to God. And the importance of the clothing is that the garments are made for the priest to what? To make us beautiful and to mark us and set us apart. Just like the police officer, you know he's a police officer by his garments. All right, we as Christians, we may not have a special suit we wear, or we may not have a special dress we wear, but we are supposed to wear the beauty of holiness. We are supposed to wear the robe of righteousness. We are supposed to put on the new man who is renewed according to the spirit of the mind. We are to put on, literally, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to be clothed in humility and tender mercies. The Bible talks about we are to put on what? the garment of praise, and exchange it for the spirit of heaviness. There's things that denote, because it's external, that that part is our choice. God can give us the armor yeah. in Ephesians 6, but how many days have we woken up and not put on our helmet of salvation, our right. shield of faith, and just walk through life like everybody else, right. half clothed, right. or unclothed, spiritually speaking. Uh -huh. And then all the darts of the yeah. enemy came at us, and we were prepared because we have to mindfully put on these garments. Even as the Old Testament priests could not approach the presence of God without penalty, without the proper clothing, you and I cannot approach the presence of God without Jesus. Right. And so to know Jesus, there's not many ways to God. God himself, even in the priesthood shows, you have to follow his prescription. The Old Testament is imperfect, but it points to the new. And you had to have the right protocol, and the protocol was you had to have the right clothing on. So when you fast forward that into the New Testament again, into Matthew 22, when Jesus said, friend, how came you into the event without the right clothes, basically? Because he furnishes the clothes. It means the guy didn't want to put them on. He just wanted to come to God any loosey-goosey way. And we see people do that. I'm going to wear what I'm going to do what I'm going to do, and I'm going to still try to get in the presence of God. Well, that didn't work out for him. He was kicked out into outer darkness. So we must understand that as priests and as kings that we've been given clothing. Now, there's one thing that's very interesting about all that is they couldn't approach Jesus at all because they didn't know he exists, but they couldn't approach the presence of God. Only the high priest could in the Holy of Holies. Regular priests and everybody else, you and I, no way, right? But now all of us as Christians and born-again believers have access into the holiest place. Amen. And the way that we have access is because we have put on and accepted yeah. the Lord Jesus into our life. So the significance of the clothing. I want us to turn now to, um, I'm going to assign a few verses. They're short ones. 
Um, Christopher, if you don't mind, could you look up Psalms 132.9? Um, Anna, could you look up for us 1 Peter 5.5? 5, 5? Um, let's see. Who else wants to read? Dad, do you want to read? Sure. Ephesians 4.24. And then, uh, Mom, do you want to read? Sure. Okay, Job 29.14. Oh, I was just thinking about what people are turning. It's kind of like um, I was recently reading the book of Esther because I just love that whole story. Of how God is portrayed even through this through this um, pagan king. You see kind of some truth about what you're talking about because when Esther was preparing to go before the king with her request, she made sure that she had the right garments on that had been provided by him. You know, her queenly garments, her crown. Yeah. And she walked forward knowing that she faced certain death if that scepter wasn't extended to her, which of course it was. But the other part of the protocol was she was mandated to go forward, touch, accept that gesture That's of right. welcome. Had <coughs> she not done that, she still would have been killed. That's true. To she had to reach so back. That's the same thing that we have today in, with Jesus. He extends that cross-shaped scepter yes, to does. every man. Amen. But we have to complete that gesture mm -hmm. and go yes. forward and grab onto that. I think we you already know? have. Because, huh? I think if we already Christian. have as yeah, Christians, like, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm saying we. Well, we, I'm not <laughs> saying we as the people, we in this room. I'm saying we as mankind. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We, we don't have to do that. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's... Um, you know, people who say, well, you know, to your point, well, I'm not going to do that. I have another, you know, I have another way that I want to go. They're not, even though that, that, you know, is being extended to them through Jesus and the cross, they're not accepting it. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, to go with that story, it's very interesting Talmudic story is that um, as God instructed the priests to put these garments on because they're holy, they're beautiful, they're glorious, that um, in the Talmud they say the wicked king, mm -hmm. Ahasuerus, who Gail's talking about, and I think some verse, versions say Ar 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 Xerxes or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he has two different names, but depending on what Bible you have. But that king, he was going to make a feast for his advisors and officers. Do you remember when he invited Mordecai? Mm -hmm. That they believed that he because it's recorded in their scroll in the telling of Esther, of the story of Purim, that he put off his own royal vestments or garments and donned the vestments of a high priest. Wow. Because that was more precious than the garments of royalty. Now this is a foreign <laughs> king we're talking about. Yeah. And it says that he had possession of those because the temple, the first temple had been destroyed by the Babylonians. So the point being is that to approach God, there was a protocol, and there mm -hmm. still is. Mm -hmm. Whosoever will, let him come. The invitation is to right. all. Right. But it says, if thou wilt believe and confess. Right? Yeah. There are protocols. The Bible tells us in the New Testament, put off the old man concerning your former conversation lust. Put on the new man. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You know, the outward man, though, the outward man is perishing. The inward man is being renewed. It says to flee from unrighteousness. It says to pursue peace with as many as you can, right, as possible. It says resist the devil. It says submit to God. It says humble yourself. So there's all these demonstrations that is asking us to partner with God, he's doing it. He's done it, but we have to reach back. And that's what Gail's talking about. Is our action is a reaching back to the scepter that Holy God has held out. All right, so um, the first verse, go ahead, Christopher, go ahead and read for us Psalms 132.9. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness, and let your godly ones sing for joy. All right, so let your priests be clothed with righteousness. Now, that's Old Testament, but we can apply that today, right? What should we be looked at as? We should be looked at as the children of God. How are we going to demonstrate that? Well, the Bible says that we have robes of righteousness, which means that it is saying that we have right standing with God. But how is the world going to know or identify that? Well, the Bible says in Matthew 6 that men will see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So what good works birthed from a good heart, doing your priestly service, people will take notice of that and give glory not to you but to God. 
All right, uh, second verse, 1 Peter 5, 5, Anna. In like manner, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. All right, so we heard from Chris that as priests, we should be clothed in righteousness. That's first and foremost. If you don't have the righteousness of Christ, we got nothing. We don't have anything. Secondly, Alan, what's it say? We're to be clothed with humility. Yes? So humility, it says, because God resists the proud. And I love that this is, this is in the Bible times when you're supposed to respect your elders. And I think a lot of that is lost even in today's society. But he doesn't just limit it to that. He says, and be ye subject, meaning all of you, one to another, young, old, male, female, we're to all be humble and subject to one another. But the only way you can do that is if you clothe yourself with humility. Right. Because I'll tell you what, the human ego is too big uh -huh. that it will not admit it's wrong. It won't say I'm sorry. It won't be right. gentle. It won't wants to rise up and it wants to yeah. vindicate and it wants to defend right. and we have a Jesus yeah. who told us the only crown I'm going to wear is a crown of thorns. Do you know that? Mm -hmm. Our Jesus, the high priests even wore a mitre mm -hmm. and you see it even in Catholic Church, mm -hmm. a type of crown or turban or a hat wear. Our Jesus wore none right. but a crown of thorns right. that man placed on it. So he says that to be an example of him, we're to be clothed as priests in righteousness and humility. Yes, Victoria? I just want to know yes. what um, the verse was that was read before this. Oh, um, yes, Christopher's verse about yeah. the, okay, that was um, Psalms 132, verse 9. And then Thank Anna's you. verse was 1 Peter, Peter 5, 5, yeah? Now the third verse Dad Noel has, Ephesians 4, 24. And that you... Put on the new man, which was created according to God, in true righteousness and holiness. All right, true righteousness and holiness, right, Dad? So the Old Testament, it says, Jesus himself said they had a form of godliness, but denied the power thereof. And in the New Testament, after Jesus died, it says that we are to put on this righteousness and the new man that has true holiness, true righteousness, because it's in Christ. And the last verse, Mama, Job 29, 14. Okay. Or 29, 14. Uh-huh. Job 29, 14. Okay. I put on righteousness, and it clothed me. My garment was as a robe and a diadem, yeah. crown. I was in eyes to the crown. That's it, Mom. That's all you got to do. Oh, okay. That's good. So I put on, verse 14, Job 29, 14 says, I put on what? Righteousness. That's right, Vicki. Righteousness. And it clothed me. So here we have two examples. We have an example of us putting on and God furnishing. But again, if I bring you back to Matthew 22, even though the bridegroom furnished garments, wedding garments to everyone in the feast, they still have a duty to put it on. Because as we saw, one guy refused to put the garment on and wanted to get into the feast. So that means he's an unbeliever. That's right. He wanted to try another, a backdoor right. way of getting yeah. access to Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. But to be a participant, you have to do it God's way. That's which right. is why it doesn't work to say all roads lead to God. They don't. God prescribed a way. He used the Old Testament as our tutor to point us to a new and living way that Gail read about in Hebrews 10. But it's not just a loosey-goose if I just think it and I kind of feel. No, God has a way. And he says that he has robes of righteousness for his priests. Because to approach God without the right clothing is to incur judgment upon ourselves. But to approach God with his righteousness and true holiness, as Dad read, to be clothed with righteousness, to put on the garments, then it says we have access. All right. All um, right. Isaiah 11.5 says, And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. And it's talking about Messiah. Righteousness will be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. In Bible terms, we know that clothing is a symbol of how we live our lives. Because it's what the world sees and can identify with. Mm -hmm. um, it can identify our profession, like I said earlier, as a police officer or a soldier. And it helps people to identify their role. As with natural clothing, our walk, our Christian walk, should be kept clean. Our uniforms should be kept clean. Our robes should be clean. 
If a priest, now you guys know I've covered this, I gave you a little teaser last, last time we talked. If a priest soiled his clothing in preparing the sacrifice or in his temple duties, he did not wash them, but he laid them aside. And later they were used as wicks for the menorah and they were burned up. In the Feast of Tabernacles, they did at the time of Sukkot, they did the water ceremony, and they did it before the temple of women, the court of the women. And in front of it were these giant menorah, and the menorah was lit with oil, but the wicks were made from those priestly garments. Which I think is very interesting when you now take that and you look at what John the Baptist said. And he said, he must increase. I must decrease. Right. Smoking flax, he will not quench. And a broken reed, he will not break. Mm -hmm. Do you get that? It's that our lives are to be consumed, a living sacrifice for God. As priests unto our God, we are to be a living sacrifice daily decreasing as he's increasing as we pour out and give our lives to others it says that jesus gave his rams his life a ransom for many likewise paul and uh, john and peter they all understood this that their life dedicated to god involved christ being exalted and their personage being diminished or used up and i like to look at that as all that we do it gets burned up i always say go big or go home because um, some of us think, well, I just don't have time, I'm tired and all this. You know what? I don't know a person in this room that would say, oh, I have nothing to do and I have lots of free time and I can, there's probably not a person in this room that could say that. So when you understand that everybody's busy, you stop being the martyr about it and say, oh, it's just me. No, we're all busy. We all have different commitments, different responsibilities. But here's the thing. If you're gonna be busy no matter what, yeah. get busy for the things of God. Amen. Because life isn't going to get to this right. pinnacle where all of a sudden you got it all controlled and it yeah. slows down. It just doesn't. Yeah. At work, at church, it just never does. I found in my life right. when you get something paid sure. off or you get certain goals accomplished, some yeah. new thing comes yeah. to take its place, right? So if we understand that that is normal, then we stop waiting for that moment where we're going to have this big coffee break. That comes in heaven maybe, and even then we're going to be busy, I think but then we'll have supernatural energy. There is no giant coffee break you're supposed to have here. He says that we are putting on these garments. Think about it, folks. I think we're not putting on the garments of a nun or a monk going to be sequestered away in a cave or in a convent somewhere. We are putting on the garments of the priest as typified in the Old Testament. They were serving their God day and night. They were not to let the candle burn out, the menorah, the light. They were to keep the table of showbread full and chained out, rotated, you know, because of they were to constantly clean and carry out the rubbish. They were to go there and make sacrifices for themselves and for the people and for the nation. They were busy. They weren't sitting around on a, you know, like we think about some mystics that sit in a cave and pray all day. They were busy serving. Most of their job was not just prayer. Most of their job was taking care of the articles of the temple. Okay, so the Lord gave me a good revelation on that. As a king and a priest, my sister spoke about this a little bit on Monday night about self-care and women. But part of your duty as a priest is to take care of the temple that God has given you. To take care of the articles of the temple. Yes, that's prayer. Yes, that is Bible study. But it also means taking care of the practical elements. Your mental well-being, your emotional well-being, your definitely your spiritual well-being, your physical well-being. At 51, going to be 52 this year, I can tell you that in the last five to seven years, I'm going to say, it has become increasingly important to me to take care of myself, and I don't mean that in That's a selfish right. way, yeah. meaning this. If I have changes in my body and things that don't work the same, and if I've got stressors in my life and things don't work the same, it's incumbent upon <coughs> me, not Tom, not the church, not my mother, not my brothers, sisters, or friends, to take care of it. But God says, you're a priest. Take care of those articles. Do what you need to do to be whole in Christ. And sometimes we like to spiritualize all that, but I want to tell you that God resonated with me. Paula, you're doing a priestly service when you take care of yourself. And taking care of yourself 
can be taking a vacation or petting the kitty, some of those things, if you're mindful and using that as a time of break and recreation. Or it could be a practical act of service and loving other people. But here's the deal. When you're doing what God designed you to do, which, by the way, you were all conscripted as soldiers, you've all been conscripted as priests and kings, that you have responsibility. You're not getting out of this life, floating on the, on the back of a... I don't know, whatever. You, know, you don't get to ride on somebody else's coattails or anything. God has given you duties. But when you're doing his duties, whatever they are, even the practical stuff, he gives you the energy, he gives you the zeal, he gives you the wherewithal. It says then we can declare boldly that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yeah. See, we've spiritualized that. We say, yeah, okay, I pray that, I confess that. But I am telling you what, I'm telling you from personal experience, which that doesn't mean anything if it doesn't line up with the Bible, but I think you'll get that it lines up with the Bible. I could sit there and run myself ragged doing the wrong thing sure. because I've done it. True. Just because people have a need doesn't mean you're supposed to fill every single need no, they have. No. Right? Because right. Jesus said a very important statement, and I want you to think about it this way. He said, the poor you will have with you always. Yeah. The poor, okay, we have to understand, the poor you will have with you always. That is a statement to remind us we are never going to fill or meet every need. No. Even we, the church, collectively, we are never. So that's why I don't agree with Pat Robertson and some of these people that bring in, that we're going to usher in God's kingdom, and then no. Jesus comes back. No. no. That's not. We don't have the ability to fix ourselves. Adam and Eve proved that. <laughs> the Levitical priesthood proved that. The prophets proved that. The judges proved that. Uh, the temple worship and the lack that it had. And the whole hierarchy of the Pharisees and the Sadducees proved we can't fix ourselves. But what we can do in the New Testament is that we can put on his robe of righteousness. He clothes us, but we have to put it on daily. And then he gives us the ability to walk in that newness of life. But you have the choice. And I think that for men and women both, I don't want to relegate this just to women. Men and women both have been sold a bill of goods that to be spiritually minded is life and peace, and that's Bible. Mm -hmm. And to be carnally minded is death. And their interpretation, this is the Bill of Goods, is that if I pray and read my Bible, and, and if I do a lot of that, that takes care of everything. Does it does a big part. You do need to have a large a diet of that. But you still have to take care of your job, your house, all the things that God has given you to steward in your world. That is why it's important for us to remember that we have a dual role in the New Testament as a king. You're not a victim. You have dominion over Amen. your domain Amen. if you're connected to Jesus. And you're a priest, which means your whole life is supposed to be meant and intended for service. Mm -hmm. And what did the priests do? It says they made atonement first for themselves, then for the people. So they had to get right with God, but then for other people, and then for the nation, right? Yeah. So part of that is they had to take care of stuff. And I just like to get it down and dirty because I was reading all this stuff. You guys, we have no idea. There's so much symbolism that I can't even cover all of it because it'll get too heady and then people get turned off. But here's the deal. Everything in that Old Testament picture of the garments, I'm going to tell you a little nerdy side thing about how it costs people something. You know how the skins that God clothed Adam and Eve with? Kill it was for it. blood, right? right? Innocent blood shed. You know, the Lamb of God. It was his blood that Gail read for us in Hebrews 10 that brought us near to God. Mm -hmm. All right, it cost him something. Mm -hmm. I want to tell you something. I'm a nerd. I read this stuff, and then I read it in this Jewish um, commentary about the priest's garments, and I was like, oh, this excites me, because now I've read it in two or three different independent sources. You know their clothing? I love that the priests wore really beautifully colored clothes. God's all about color, people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's not about just basic black. <laughs> He's all about white. He's all about crimson red, blue, uh, indigo, purple, gold, silver, bronze. He's into color. And, and the... And the ephod that the priest wears you know over it is that breastplate with all those stones that have the names of the 12 tribes of israel on it and you know those colors they're tied to their banner colors of that tribe Ooh, that's really cool. okay nerdy thing here's the thing 
wow, I just get so excited about nerdy stuff. You know the indigo color of the robe? That's like a, this is kind of too blue, but it's like a blue purple. Yeah. And you know the scarlet? Okay, I'm gonna tell you something. Scarlet and purple. The Romans had lots of togas and they'd have purple sashes. It was super expensive. You could get a cheap woolen flax and garment, mm -hmm. but it was really expensive. Why was it expensive? Anna, do you know? Do you have to I, know? I don't know the specifics, but I do know that those colors, because I actually studied that one time, mm -hmm. the inks to make that yeah. are very, very rare. Do you know why? Rare. Back then? I think it from, it's from where it comes from. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is correct. All right, so does anybody have a guess why it's expensive because of where it comes from? What does that mean? What? Why would it be expensive to make purple rare. or make that? What, Dad? Rare. It's rare, that's right. Anybody else? Okay. This is going to blow your mind away. It blew my mind away. I read about this about eight or nine years ago, and I was, I'm an empath, so I feel bad when living creatures die for stuff, and I know I eat hamburger and all that. And I, yeah, so <laughs> I'm going to tell you a little story now. In Mexico, you know the prickly pear? Mm -hmm. They have a certain kind of bug that likes to live on the prickly pear. Do you know, Stephanie? What do they do? Yes, that's right. Cockmeal. Cock and it takes massive amounts to gather all those little bugs and then make the dye, but I don't remember how many bugs per. I don't remember how many bugs either, but they're really little. There's a cockmeal type of. But you know how they make that red dye? Yeah. Squish them. Wow. They express Great. They squish them. those bugs. Now yeah. imagine this tiny, let's say it's the size, let's say, of like a ladybug. Okay. Get Think about lot. how many of those it would take to make a single wow. pint of red dye, because it's imagine. red that comes from those. Wow. Yeah. All right, so in the Bible days, you know where they got their dye from? Uh -huh. They got it from sea snails. Sea snails? sea snails? Sea snails. Was the red, was so, the red dye? Uh, the red dye could, was also from a type of snail too, Stephanie, but they would mix these colors and they came from a couple different types of sea snails. What would they do to these poor snails? It just, it freaks me out. No, it does, it freaks me out. They would get them and they would quote, I'm gonna use a nice word, express, express them. Like you know when you express a zit, it means you squeeze it, okay? Mm -hmm. That's, all right, they would squeeze these things, and here's how man is. They would squeeze them to the point of exhaustion. I know it's just a little animal, but the animal would secrete this indigo dye that they would mix with other red and make purple. Well, think about how many of those it would take. Well, then you know man is greedy, right? So man does not, so then they start expressing these things like 50, 60 times, and the animal dies. It gives its life so that people could have this dye. The high priest's garments, even the Jews believe in the temple service, and I read this from an English book from England about color and dyes, and this is from a Jewish Jewish, Jewish temple survey. So they said that it came from these sea snails. The British believe that in Roman days, in Bible days, that's how they got these expensive dyes. It cost somebody their life. This poor animal is basic, even though you don't maybe think of it as an animal, this little mollusk, he's expressed and expressed and expressed and expressed till he just dies because they get greedy. They don't give him enough time to recover and they just give it all its worth till he's dead. And it's nothing to them to make these dyes to look like kings and queens. That's what they did with the squid to get the ink out. And the same thing with the squids too, the sea squids and all that with their, with their ink. So something had to die to make the clothing for the priest. How in the heck did they get those in the desert? You know, Gail, there was Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, yeah. and they did have coastal towns. That's where it came from, and that's like Anna's saying, it came from a long way off. Right. It came from Phoenicia, I'm which just was thinking when they first had to make them for the first tabernacle. They had to import wow. it. They had to import just like the Queen of Sheba bringing her gifts yeah. and stuff. They had to import it's it from like Phoenicia. Like silk from China, all the silk. Yeah, they, they had, had no to import all this stuff. They imported it from Phoenicia. Like Phoenicia is one of the, like Tyre and Sidon, all those oh, coastal so cities. That's who had these mollusks. And isn't it ironic that again, innocent blood shed to adorn. Okay, yeah. so think about it as you and I now, fast forward. We have Jesus, innocent Amen. blood shed so that you and I could be clothed in the right robe. Mm -hmm. 
and it says that our robes are white, but they've been, this is the irony, they've been made white by the blood of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how it works physics-wise, people, but it even says that his blood, he's, he has blotted out all our sins by his blood. Mm -hmm. Now, how does blood equal a magic eraser and blot it all out? That's God's physics, but I want to say that innocent blood was shed so that you and I could wear the right That's garments. Right. Amen. And even in the priest's day, yeah. it costs a lot of money, so you better not get it dirty. Mm -hmm. But it cost innocent blood. Yeah. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. All right, Anna, go ahead. I was just going to say, if you think of the color white, you know, when I was in hair school and we were talking about color, or people that go through art school and you're talking about color, when light sees the color white, it's not that it's absent of color, it's just that it's broken up into such small little atoms and molecules, your eye only sees the white. And so when I think of Jesus' blood being shed and us being white, it's because he's taken all of our sin, sins and all of our dirt and all of our blackness and fleshly things, and he's, like where it says, he's dispersed it as far as the east from the west, so our eyes don't see that anymore. He's separated it all, he's broken Amen. it all up. So. He totally has, that's right. It's not the absence of color, that's right. Um, so when we first read in Exodus 28, we were talking about to make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother, for glory and beauty or honor and dignity, I was talking about. They were supposed to be beautiful, but Jesus has a comment about putting on those clothes. Let's look at Matthew 5, 20. Matthew 5, 20. thought you'd appreciate that interesting sort of historical... That is interesting. Uh, and Stephanie's right too. In Mexico, Mexico was known for their nopales. The prickly pear is the nopales, and they would cultivate these little cochineal bugs for the express purpose of the Peruvians and the Chileans and the Hispanic peoples. That's where they got their red dye from, from these little animals. Okay, Matthew five twenty. Who would like to read? Okay. Go ahead, Christopher. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. So unless there's an inner beauty that God can see, then what is pleasing on the outside is just show, right? So God's desire is not that we adorn the outward man. He does that. But when you're a beautiful person, have you ever known or met a person that was just kind of okay looking or maybe even kind of homely, mm -hmm. but their spirit was so beautiful, it just, yes. it just yeah, lit them up? Yeah. You know, I remember this one time, Tom didn't know this one lady, I did, I worked with her, and um, she was not physically attractive from man's standards, but to me, she was so beautiful, she was so put here, and she just exuded that. It was like this inner beauty that just radiated out of her, you know, and, um, and that's what God's looking for. Yes. So it's not so much that clothes make the man, but the man makes the clothes. Right. And guess what? God is the one that does the clothing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, uh, it's not uh, Tommy Hilfiger or Calvin Klein. It's Jesus. And you know what I love about Jesus is he doesn't just give you a suit off the rack. He mm -hmm. tailor-made it just yes. for you and me. Right. That salvation, that appointment with salvation and righteousness, he tailored it just for you and I. Nancy, do you feel like reading this morning, or can you with your eyes this no, morning? I don't bring a Bible. Oh, okay. All right, so we're talking about the garments, and it says that except our righteousness exceeds the righteousness mm -hmm. of the scribes and Pharisees, will in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, do you remember the garments of the scribes and the Pharisees? They had all the proper clothing on, and in fact, uh, Jesus ridicules them and says, you make your hems yeah. broad, and, you know, and your prayer boxes, those phylacteries that wow. they strapped on. You got those everywhere on your head and on your arms, which was supposed to remind them of the word of God. They were like visual reminders. He says, but you're basically like dead men. You make this outward show, but it equals uh -huh. nothing right. in God's eyes, right? Yeah. Because they just had an outward show of glory, but they didn't have the inward we as kings and priests unto our Lord have been given, the Lord Jesus himself. He dwells within us, that we have access to his holy presence, that that should infuse us, and he's clothed us. And I know it gets confusing for some people, at, um, you know, um, maybe Bob, I noticed he's not here now, but um, it's that inner and outer always work together. 
Yeah. There's an inward experience. Mm -hmm. There's. Yeah. I don't care who you are, and people can argue it all they want. There's always going to be dual. Yeah. I don't care if you're Polly B or Pete Cabrera, because they actually agree with this too. They say it differently, but that you know, like salt and pepper, that there is a choice you make yeah. every, every day. day. Right. It's putting on the armor of God. Yeah. It's putting yeah. on the new man, and they all agree with that. And when they say things like just live in what you are or be what you are, they're right. Walk in that identity. Mm -hmm. But saying that you are something, you still have to choose. As an officer, mm -hmm. you're a police officer. Whether you got the uniform on or you're in your long johns, you're a police officer. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to go out and do your job, you got to put on the uniform. Mm -hmm. That's right. See what I'm saying? Or you're not going to have the authority. Or you're not going to have the authority. You're not going to have the equipment that you need. You have to put on the armor of God. You got to put on the new man. And so I don't know why people get so confused about this. To me, it's pretty basic. It's that you are a new man. You've been given tools. You need to exercise those right, options. Right. You need to exercise those tools. Because it's an inner and an outward thing. You have been made new on the inside. The outward man is perishing. But the Bible says there's going to come a day where he addresses even that outward man with a new glorified body. Mm -hmm. So when people put on these clothing, they see the priest putting on an ephod, and an ephod was a coat that reached, it was kind of like a, I'm going to say like a pinafore actually, you know, it had a hole cut out for the head and some armholes, and it came down to about mid-thigh, you know, mid-thigh or bottom of the thigh, somewhere right around there they believe, and it had many different colors interwoven in, gold, blue, scarlet, or red, purple, upon white linen, upon white linen, so it's white and it's righteous, but I already shared with you the significance of some of those colors. Plus, those colors all have symbolism of God. Blue is the heavens where God dwells. Gold has to do with his deity. White has to do with his purity. Red has to do with the blood, innocent bloodshed. Uh, purple has to do with royalty. All of that went woven into the basic tunic. You have all of that. You have the blood shed for you. You have been made a son or daughter of Christ. You are a king and a priest. You have the blood shed. You are joined to the Lord as one spirit with him, so you know his deity. You know that he has made you his righteousness through his blood. Yes. So um, an example... This is really cool. An example of an ephod, many Bible scholars believe, before there was such a thing, was Joseph's coat. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a symbol of it. Yeah. I've always watched yeah. Vicky's like, yeah, it's right. You know, Vicky, it's just you and our son in a connection, right? It's resonating. I mean, I'm tingling right now. Because she's like nodding like, yes, and I'm like, yes. And before there was the priesthood, Joseph had that special coat. Who made the coat for him? Yeah. Daddy. Daddy. His father. Yeah, that's what he said. And it was so much so, it made the other boys jealous. jealous. And why did they kill Jesus? Why were the Pharisees so jealous. mad at Jesus? They were jealous because he spoke with power and authority. Right. Right. They say, crucify him, kill him, got the people all whipped up. Because his daddy gave him a special coat yes. that they didn't have. They could knit it and make all the yeah. stuff they wanted. Mm -hmm. But when God, when your daddy gives you a coat, you're set apart. And yes, Amen. There are enemies that will look oh, at that yeah. coat and who now let's say that coat today let's say you've got the mark of the holy spirit and we wonder why satan comes against us you got a special oh, coat on you got a special yeah. seal on you uh -huh. and you do as a king and priest you have a choice the enemy is going to rage okay right. he just does yes it's sort of like a bacteria guys we're surrounded by cancer all the time did you know that oh, yeah. cancer cells abide all the time flu bugs things are all around us your what the difference is, is our immune system. You and I, the difference between us getting cancer and not getting cancer, besides, of course, God. I'm, I don't want to deny right. you guys. But it has to do with not about the cancer cells being more here or there. It has to do with your immune system. The miracle of Same <laughs> thing in the body of Christ. The difference about you going through the test and demonic attack is realizing who you are. And if your spiritual immune system is queued up, you know, I'm a king, I'm a priest, ouch, this hurts, boy, this is tough, I don't like this, I'm in pain, but my daddy made me a coat. And my daddy, unlike Joseph's father, we got a father that will never leave us or forsake us. He won't let us get overturned, sold out, killed, threatened. He takes care of us. And he's made a coat for us because he said, you're my favorite. And I want to tell you today, each one of us is his favorite. We're all his favorite. 
So Joseph's coat, many people believe, because Joseph also was a picture of Christ. Mm -hmm. Joseph is another form of like Joshua and Yeshua, right. that he was wearing this coat. Now, do you remember the garment? It says, what did they do? What did the soldiers do? Go ahead, Gil. What did, so, what did the Roman soldiers do with Jesus' coat? They tore it. Yep. And one of them, they didn't want to tear because it was so valuable. Right. 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 White linen tunic. Do I just trigger something? Yeah, go, Stephanie. Long holding with Joseph's coat when they threw him in, and then they dipped the coat in the blood. Is that? Have an animal. Is that? Stephanie, go. Go, Stephanie, go. When Jesus comes back on the white horse, it says he has a robe, what? Dipped in blood. You hit it, sister. Yeah, you hit it, sister mama. You hit it, sister mama. No, about that, 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 that he's a rope that they're trying to tear. Cannot tear because they, they were it. You did, it well, yeah. it says that they thought, it, no, one of them they tore and divided among themselves. The yes, soldiers right. one well, piece. Yeah. The other one, right. okay. they didn't. And many scholars believe it's because it was so valuable and it was well woven. Yes. It right. was a beautiful linen garment. Mm -hmm. Okay? So here's the thing. If Jesus flesh is the veil and if they couldn't tear that I'll tell you what I think that means I think that means that his divinity his purity they could touch the outward man they could not touch his soul just like the devil could all right also uh, our father in heaven he gives us a coat when we enter into covenant relationship with Jesus we become what not only his sons his favorite sons and daughters but his priests again this coat makes us stand out and it makes us what capable and qualified for service because our righteousness our robe was like a filthy rag when we put on his garment we're qualified to go to the feast we're qualified to serve he makes us able ministers of the new testament vicky well while you're saying that i was also thinking that um it also enables us to go to that great wedding feast in heaven amen Not just the, the, the wedding feast that that the wedding uh, that you were talking about earlier. Yeah, the about, parable. But, yeah. But the one the one in, in heaven that's waiting for us. Mm -hmm. And we'll all get to sit at that table and eat. Amen. And, and we're all going to have the right clothes. We all have to be wearing And we didn't clothes. have to go to Ross or be a, <laughs> or be a Maxinista or you know, TJ Maxx. But he furnishes the robe. We Amen. just have to put it on. Amen. And not be like that dude that was rebellious that just thought, I'm going to wear my Levi's and... You know, I like that stuff too, but nope, you got to come on his robe. Yep. Um, it's our duty to keep our robe pure and spotless. Right. right. Right? It's our duty. If we willfully defile our garment or cast it off, if we willfully do that, that's a problem. Yes, Gail? I was going to say the inner man is always clothed in that garment of righteousness. Always. Amen. Always. always. There's no loss of that covering. That's right. But what our responsibility is, is to work out that soul salvation. And notice the word work mm -hmm. was used because it is work. Yes, I mean, it's it not, is work. It doesn't come naturally no, no, to no, this no. outer man. Yeah. I mean, that comes right. naturally to us. Is eating is, chocolate laying around? Well, and, you know, anyway. getting up in somebody's face if they've offended us or whatever. Right, you know, um, right. And spending time in the word and spending time in prayer. You know, that doesn't come naturally, but no. that's part of feeding that inner man. Uh -huh. But that garment is yeah. always in place. I know, you know, I think that's where some people get confused. You know, we're not talking about you have to re-clothe the inner man every day. It's the outer man being willing to it's be in subjection to that. It's that it's putting down the carnal man. We're yeah. supposed to die to him. Yes. But he keeps trying to reanimate like a yeah. Yeah. Like the zombie apocalypse. He keeps wanting to come back, and we have to keep renewing that and saying, you're dead, I'm not you anymore. This is me today. And Paula, just like on Monday when I talked about that little tidbit out of C.S. Lewis, yeah. I mean, we have to put an attempt or an effort to take those scales off, those dirty scales. And ultimately, yes, God has to do it. We have to allow him to do that to us. But it's a painful experience, and... I wish I could say, because I don't think there's a single human on this earth today, because they could walk the earth and just say that they're walking in the spirit every day no, in all areas. No, no. So it is a battle of taking off that yeah, lower right. nature, yeah. that flesh man, because the flesh man 
is constantly wanting to rule. So yeah. God puts people in our paths. I'm thinking of two people in my life. None of them are here, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, that God, I have just, by the Spirit, the Lord has said, look, that person is in your life mm -hmm. to teach you yep. to not do this. You know, yeah. and they're going to mm -hmm. continue to bother you mm -hmm. until you I, I just until you just don't let them bother you just, anymore. Until you're done. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. true. If you reject yes. it, then you're going to give another one to. They're such a blessing. So each of the colors of the garments all have a symbolism, and um, you know we can go more into depth with that next week. But I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because um, I want to talk about the red fabric or thread. So as blue represents heaven and God in his heaven, red represents man. Did you know Adam's name means red man? Because he was made with blood and flesh. So red represents man. The word for man in Hebrew is practically the same as the word for blood and the word for red. Wow, that's interesting. Red is the color of the flesh and the color of the blood that flows through it. Both flesh and blood are reminders of the imperfections of our sinful nature in the carnal man. Now, I want to say this. I came up with this thing the other day. I was cracking myself up. Okay, so everybody, you know, don't you like crack yourself if you have to. Life's just too short to be all upset all the time. True. So um, the people have this big chili debate, chili with beans or without, yeah. right? Okay. All right, but I, I was thinking about this because I was thinking of Red Man and I was thinking of the Flash and I was thinking about J.R. and Tom and how they love meat and Patrick and all these guys that love meat. And then I realized God told me a little funny joke and I started cracking, I was cracking up. He said, Paula, when you're doing what you want to do instead of what I want to do, you're Paula con carne, like chili con carne <laughs> with meat. You're being Paula with flesh added on, right? Uh, so when I'm being Paula con carne, Paula with meat, I'm like, oh gosh, Lord, he's saying the carnal nature. Wow. You're being flesh Paula. And I was writing that to Gail in an email. I said, yeah, this was being Paula new woman uh -huh. instead of Paula con carne, you know? Because Paula con carne is like, mm, you know, Paula new man, new woman, new man, new woman. See, like I used to say, Melanie, I share your last name. I'm Paula Newman, but actually I'm Paula New Woman. When I'm Paula New Woman, I think it, I feel it for two seconds, I get rid of it, and I say, that's not Christ. Right. That's the yeah, concarnate. Yeah, that's the yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, I just want to remind you, like chili, there's meat in chili or yeah. not, and we don't want to have that concarnate side of us dominate the flavor of our, mm -hmm. of our soup. Yes, Victoria? So, Adam... Um, yes. Well, I must have heard this. Yes. That it's Red Man, but I always thought that Red Man was because he was created from the red clay. That all fits. It's possible. But I don't Mickey, know. Mickey, I mean, that all. No, now, Mickey. It's. I've heard that too. Yeah. It all fits. It all has to do with his flesh and blood and clay, all of it. Yeah. It's I all. I never heard the flesh and the blood yeah. thing. Yeah. I just thought, thought it was the dirt. Yeah, well, the flesh and blood are dirt, basically, that well, God yeah. animated. But yeah. Yeah. yeah, right? From the dust you came, the dust right. So that goes with it. But like totally. red clay, you know, the red. Yeah. The red yeah. I, I have no problem yeah. that I've heard that too, and I think that they coincide. So anything to, do, somewhere. <laughs> anything to do with the natural, right? In, in um, Hawaii, they have a lot of red earth because oh, the iron ore are in it, yeah. right? So, um, yeah, red man, that has to do with the nature, the natural man. Yeah. Now, Hebrews 2, 14 through 15 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, Jesus, also himself likewise took part of the same. And that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So Jesus, the red that's in the high priest's garment, the woven colors of that, Jesus himself identified by becoming a flesh and blood man. He's yeah. fully God, fully man, and we know that we identify him as God manifested in the flesh. And Jesus did that so that he could what? The reason he did that is he had this body made for him so that it could suffer death and make atonement for us. And it says so that he could also identify with us. It says that he took on the nature of the sons of Abraham, not the nature of angels. Because he wanted to identify with us so that then he could qualify to take the power of death from the devil. 
because he became a perfect man that would offer himself without sin. So Jesus underwent real trials. He had to go through real temptations and lusts of the flesh. And only by suppressing and overcoming that natural self could he be sinless. And we know he did. We have the weakness of mortality now, so we have to rely on God. But Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. So that red has so much power because it's identifying with the flesh nature, but it's also identifying with the innocent blood of Jesus. And as I said earlier, the innocent blood of these animals that was shed to create the dye. It all points to God. All those natural examples point to bloodshed, that God used the sacrifices in the Old Testament to get across to us, even in the New Testament, where we have a different mindset of how costly it was to secure our salvation. It wasn't just a cheap, easy grace. All right, and I told you this, um, I think, a couple weeks ago when we covered it, is that the same, I just love this. The same materials and colors that were used in the curtain and the veil of the temple mm -hmm. are the same colors and materials used in the priest's garments. Mm -hmm. And so when the temple, gar uh, temple curtain was torn in two, mm -hmm. and it talks about Christ's body being the veil, mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, those priestly garments that we wear are to again identify us with Christ. Our oneness with him and his presence his presence because what was the curtain for it was to separate from the presence all right so I see people looking at the clock so that means it's my time to quit so we're gonna go ahead and close for now and we have one more week and then I will be out and you will have a substitute teacher and then um, we will start a new series Amen. so uh, Christopher Amen. might I ask you to close us in prayer today Heavenly Father we thank you for all these great revelations and it's time to fellowship and learn together uh, we thank you for the service upstairs also that we'll be joining shortly. Thank you for the worship and that it's a beautiful sunny day here in Seattle. Amen. And thank you for the health of everyone who's shown up today. Amen. And bless you, Lord, and thank you very much. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you. Thank you. Those little animals, they, like they disappeared it. because they damaged them so bad they didn't have them anymore. And they and the wings on the, the prayer shawl, the little blue things are braided in. And, well, that was made by that little creature animal. also. That's right. And so they couldn't find it for years, and now it's just come back. Yeah, that's right, Mom. It yeah. was called the something murex, is the yeah. genus species. M U R E X something is the type of snail. Because they, like man does with the birds and the kite, they just kill so many of them. That they practically go extinct, if not extinct, right? They're going to yeah. build a new temple, and that was holding each other. One of the things. Oh, that's the cool. Camp. I didn't know that. That the was one half of the. Just like the red heifer, they have to have everything. Now they have everything. Now they just yeah. need the space. 